three, two, one, zero. All engine running. After more than 50 years away, the U.S. is preparing for a return to the moon's surface in 2024. But unlike the Apollo missions of the 60s and 70s, NASA is hitching a ride on a commercial lander on board a commercial rocket. We'll talk more about United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket in another video, but for now, let's focus on the spacecraft heading to the moon, the Astrobotic Lunar Lander. It's incredibly thrilling. You know, we've been talking about this mission for 16 years as an organization, our first mission to the moon, and now it's finally here. So the team is exhilarated, anxious to get off the launch pad and ready to fly. So it's it's really, it's a dream come true now that we're, we're here. This is actually the moment. The Pittsburgh-based Astrobotic was one of nine companies selected in 2018 to take part in NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLIPS program. The Peregrine Lander was assembled inside a clean room adjacent to a public museum called the Moonshot Museum. It includes a large window into the clean room, which allowed visitors to see the progress on the spacecraft before it was shipped down to Florida. We built Peregrine in a 100K class clean room in accordance with our standards for cleanliness for the spacecraft. And so we've maintained that environment as it's transiting and through the encapsulation process. Um, we have also made sure that we have followed all the planetary protection I wouldn't say regulations, but approaches that are that we feel are required as well as are in alignment with what best practices for the moon. And so uh, that process and, and that um, uh, that flow has been maintained and will continue to be maintained through the launch. But it's not a particularly complicated um, uh, process. It's not like a Mars mission, um, which has a higher level of planetary protection requirement involved. The launch of the Peregrine lander shifted out of its planned late December window due to the need for further Vulcan rocket testing but its flight plan for reaching the moon remains largely unchanged as far as duration goes. So once the spacecraft separates from the Vulcan Centaur, it powers up, and then it makes uh, the journey through its first phasing loop that goes out to lunar distance. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to check out the vehicle, uh, understand its, its performance since it is the first time it's flying through space. Um, it'll come back around the Earth, it'll slingshot, and then go out to meet the moon where it will be at that point. Um, at that point, we'll do a lunar orbit insertion burn that'll put us in a highly elliptical orbit to start. Um, we'll then uh, circularize a, a, a little bit into a uh, less elliptical orbit, uh, and then we will circularize to a 100 by 100 kilometer ellipse uh, in which we then linger until uh, the lunar lighting conditions are just right. We want to land in the early morning at the landing site. And so uh, we'll wait for those lighting conditions to line up, and then we'll start to, to make the power descend down to the surface. The exact timing from launch to landing can vary. Hendrickson says it depends on the day and the time that they're able to launch. Nominally, the process takes between 30 and 39 days, but it could last up to 54 days, according to a NASA presentation. We worked very closely with ULA to maximize all the available opportunities. Um, we wanted to make sure that Peregrine has the best possible chance to succeed on its way to the surface and give it the best possible window to land. Um, so we worked very closely with them over the, the time that we've been on contract together. It's been a great working relationship and we found the, the sweet spot. As noted in this mission animation, the Peregrine lander can hang out for quite some time in what it calls Lunar Orbit 2. Hendrickson says that's partly because they're using a hypergolic-based propulsion system. So we don't have uh, any issues with any of the propellant like um, outgassing away over time. Um, and so um, it gives us quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and uh, it, 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 it will be fine as far as waiting for any kind of lighting conditions. They're, the full opportunities and launch windows that we have available to us um, will allow us to, to linger as long as we need to ultimately for the vehicle. As it's making its way down to the moon's surface, Astrobotic will be testing a device made in-house, a visual guidance apparatus called the Terrain Relative Navigation or TRN system. This won't be used for actually guiding the lander this time, but this testing will help prove its capabilities for the forthcoming Griffin lander. Our landing ellipse is, is very forgiving on the first mission. Uh, on the second mission, it's a lot tighter. We need to hit a, a much more uh, precise landing ellipse at the South Pole. And so uh, we will take the, the performance of that sensor, the data, and, and the full uh, uh, performance that it, that it uh, operates on Peregrine. We'll learn from that and apply lessons learned then for Griffin for that, that sensor, which will then be in the loop and be relied upon for that precise landing ellipse. Following its selection for the CLIPS program in 2018, 
In 2019, NASA announced Astrobotic was receiving a $79.5 million award to fly a mission to Lacus Mortis in July 2021. The site was chosen by Astrobotic to best suit the safety and performance of the Peregrine lander. However, the journey to the large crater on the near side of the moon was not meant to be. After years of delays in development, in February 2023, the mission was delayed yet again, but this time it was because of the destination. NASA said the original landing site was changing due to the maturation of the Artemis program. NASA said it became evident the agency could increase the scientific value of the NASA payloads if they were delivered to a different location. Hence, the landing site was shifted to an area called Sinus Viscositatis. It's located outside of the Grothusian domes on the near side of the moon. NASA describes the site as a, quote, geological enigma since it consists of an ancient hardened lava flow. Regardless of location, Hendrickson says being one of, if not the first commercially built lander to try and safely touch down on the moon's surface is no easy feat. There's no doubt about it. It is a challenging and difficult venture. It's hard even for a nation state to take on a moon landing. So certainly it's, it's, a, it's a, a large mountain to climb. Um, we've got a great team. They've been working for, for literally years now. I mean, go, again, going back to 16 years at the founding of the company, we were planning to do commercial lunar deliveries. Once on the surface of the moon, Peregrine is designed to operate for 8 to 10 Earth days. That's when the majority of its payloads will operate. As a NASA CLIPS mission, it has five NASA payloads on board. The Laser Retro Reflector Array is a passive optical instrument designed to act as a location marker on the lander for other spacecraft. The Neutron Spectrometer System will study the lunar regolith at the landing site and measure the presence of hydrogen. The Linear Energy Transfer Spectrometer is a radiation monitor. It's based on hardware that flew aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft during the Exploration Flight Test 1 back in 2014. The Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer System is designed to measure both the surface and the subsurface hydration on the Moon. It will measure water and OH, as well as CO2 and methane, while simultaneously mapping the surface temperature and morphology. And finally, there is the Peregrine Ion Trap Mass Spectrometer. It is designed to characterize the moon's exosphere after descent and landing. Its observations of the outermost part of the moon's atmosphere will help researchers understand the volatiles kicked up on the surface. Beyond these five, there are also 15 payloads from customers and research universities around the world. We're really excited to have the whole world be on board. Uh, we have seven nations that are represented uh, across the 16 different customers. Um, so not only is the U.S. returning to the moon for the first time since Apollo 17, but we're carrying a variety of international partners, um, giving them their opportunity to touch down on the surface and operate. And that's no small thing. Among the 16 customers is also Pittsburgh-based Carnegie Mellon University and its Iris Rover. The shoebox-sized robot weighs just four pounds and is designed to operate for 50 hours on the moon's surface. The Iris rover carries multiple distinctions, among them being the first nano-lunar rover, the first university-built lunar rover, and the first American lunar robot, all wrapped up in one tiny package. Hendrickson says they are eager to share the moment that the U.S. returns to the moon with folks around the globe. It will definitely be live. Um, yeah, everyone can tune in and, and watch as it happens, and then we'll, we'll send out those first images as soon as we get them. Reporting for Spaceflight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.